thank you so much for coming. I hope you are all doing well. Um, my name is Sarah and I use she, her pronouns and I live in Massachusetts. I love LGBTQ history, um, AKA queer history. Um, I, before we even start, um, when I say queer history, um, I'm using that, it, you know, queer is a really complicated word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And what I'm going to use it for today is um, an umbrella term for anyone who um, in the past, since we're talking about history, didn't fit in to um, the gender identity norms of their time, the um, heterosexual norms of their time, um, or who wouldn't have fit into the norms of our time. So basically, um, anybody who's not cisgender and anybody who's not straight. Um, terms are really tricky when it comes to talking about history because words like gay and trans um, have only been around for a couple generations and but gay and trans people have existed forever so um, we're gonna talk about that it's kind of a complicated thing to start off with but I did just want to mention I am going to be using this word queer um, and I just mean like anything not straight or not cis by that. Um, could people type into the chat if they, if you understand what I mean when I say cisgender? Okay. No. Yes. Awesome. So, um, does the person who answered, oh, okay. So, um, usually I would like invite somebody who, um, answered yes to, uh, give the definition that they understand for cisgender to everybody. Um, does, Anyone want to type that into the chat for anyone who answered no? Okay, I haven't seen one yet, so I'll go. Um, Thank you. Um, one person wrote, anybody who identifies with the gender they were assigned with at birth. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, any, when I say anyone not cisgender, I'm talking about anybody who doesn't identify with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, so this was where I was going to have you enter into the chat. Um, maybe where you are, um, what your name is, what pronouns you use, but most people already wrote that in. Um, I'm gonna give you some time while I introduce myself to type in your answers if you haven't already. Um, and of course, totally optional, you don't need to um, reveal anything about yourself if you don't want to, you're free to just watch. So, um, I already said, my name is Sarah. I live with my wife, Liz, and our two kids. Um, our three-year-old has not gone by the name we gave her at birth for several months and switches between Ariel, Jasmine, Anna, um, and multiple other names, Daniel Tiger, uh, lots of different character names, um, changes multiple times a day. Um, the baby, we named her Molly, um, but 
her name is also changed whenever our three-year-old changes. So if our three-year-old is Jasmine, baby is Abu. If our three-year-old is Rapunzel, baby is Pascal. Um, if three-year-old is Ariel, baby is Flounder. So um, me and my wife get assigned either villains, princes, etc. cetera. Uh, it's constantly uh, changing and often fun, sometimes confusing. Um, so they're all upstairs and we're all home and doing all right. Uh, I first started teaching myself queer history when I was a teenager, um, just at my school's library and online. And um, in 2013, I created a free mobile app called Quist, short for queer history. Uh, and that's still online today, but it's pretty buggy and unfunded. Uh, so beware, hasn't been updated in a long time now, uh, but it is still out there. My first book came out in 2017. It's called Queer There and Everywhere. You can get an ebook through your local library in a lot of cases um, right now, or order um, a hard copy online. Um, that book is a young adult book, so it is written for teens specifically, and it is a collection of short biographies of 23 people from queer history. Uh, and then my next book comes out in two months, uh, and that is for eight to 12 year olds. And it is a collection of even shorter biographies of 50 people from queer history. So today I am going to share the stories of some of the people from those books. And uh, yeah, that's, that's me. I love queer history. Um, I'm really excited to share it with you today. So some people who answered, we have Amber with two moms is here, Delia with Brianna, um, we have Tristan with Haley. Um, so welcome everybody, thank you for sharing your intros. I guess I can't do space, I have to click. Or is there a lot? Okay. So here are some really big words. I know we have a few under teen people here. I did want to say um, queer history can um, have some really bad parts to it. Um, we are talking about sexual orientation, so I'm going to mention um, people's romantic relationships. Um, I am going to mention, <laughs> I know, um, I'm going to mention discrimination that happened to some people in queer history based on their their gender or their sexuality or their race. And since all of these people have passed um, because they are from history, um, it might come up uh, how they died and things like that. Uh, this is teen friendly um, and I will make it as preteen friendly as possible as well. Um, knowing that that's all there, if you want to mute me at any point or stop listening, I won't be offended at all. And um, so keep that in mind as we wade into this very awesome history, but um, you know, sometimes a little sad. So what are we looking at today? I'm going to give a little overview and then my favorite part is sharing specific people's stories. I'm going to talk about six um, different stories of queer people from history today. And there's going to be plenty of time at the end for a Q&A. But if you have questions that can't wait, you can feel free to put them in the chat and I will get to them whenever I can. All right. So first, 
I want to hear from you what first comes to mind when you hear queer history or LGBTQ history. Um, it could be a person, an event, a place, a feeling. Um, when I say queer history, what do you think? And you can use the chat for this. All right, someone just said Harvey Milk. I'm gonna see what other answers we get. Provincetown, I have been to Provincetown a few times. I love it there. Hopefully we'll have family week this year. We're planning on going. Abraham Lincoln, one of the people in my first book. Ellen. So I'm getting a lot of people. And history is made up of people, right? I mean, everything, you know, we're thinking a lot about like personal choices right now. Um, we're all shaping history by, you know, doing this online and stuff. And so those choices that we make have a huge impact on the world. And we can see that in what's going on around us right now. So um, people like Harvey Milk and Ellen DeGeneres and Abraham Lincoln um, had huge impacts with their oh, choices. And um, we can learn a lot from um, making brave choices like that. Um, Okay. Has anyone ever heard of Stonewall? No. No, I see shaking heads from the people who have their cameras on and a nodding head and a yes. Okay. So, um, I yeah, again, usually I would ask somebody to tell the story of Stonewall, but I think to um, keep this easier with typing, um, I'll just give a little story. So for the people who have heard of Stonewall, does anyone know when the event associated with this Stonewall Inn happened? What year? Someone's drawing on the screen. How is that happening? <laughs> okay. All right. So in the year 1969, um, there was a really um, important pivotal moment that happened in queer history. In queer history, we talk about pre-Stonewall and post-Stonewall. That's how important it was. So, um, what riot um, again of queer people fighting back against um, police oppression. And in the 1960s, in the U.S., um, being queer was illegal in just about every way possible. Um, dressing in clothing of the sex you were not assigned at birth was illegal. Um, dancing with someone of the same sex was illegal. Serving alcohol to gay people was illegal. Um, there were laws against pretty much every way you could be queer. Um, and it was a really tough time for queer people. Queer people had some spaces like this queer bar, the Stonewall Inn in New York City. And uh, the since it was an illegal um, establishment, a criminal business by being a queer bar, uh, the police would often raid it. And they would check everyone's IDs and arrest people and take them off to jail in paddy wagons. And this would happen all the time, except for this one night in June 1969 when the police came in at 1.20 a.m. for a raid 
And this time, um, the people inside fought back. And um, there was a big fight. And while there had been um, organizing and uprisings and riots of queer people before this one, um, something about this one just changed the whole shape of the movement. And the summer after was just full of organizing and it kind of birthed the queer rights movement um, as we know it, even though it was um, already underway in the 1960s. So um, it's really important to know that trans women of color were the leaders of this uprising and that um, trans women of color were excluded from the organizing that happened um, directly following it. So if you end up reading Queer There and Everywhere, there's a chapter, one of the 23 people in there is um, Sylvia Rivera. And Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, her best friend, um, worked together in New York City to make a lot of positive changes for their communities. Um, but they were kind of battling against um, gay, cisgender, um, white men who were trying to make changes just for their part of the community. And so, you know, there's an important lesson for today in there about everybody working together um, across all kinds of groups. And um, so that's my little history lesson moment is just saying what Stonewall was because um, it's so pivotal in queer history. Um, the rest of this is mostly super cool stories about individuals who um, were really amazing. So um, I do have one more question before we get to those stories. Um, does anyone know how far back queer history goes? Do you know, like what's the earliest that you can think of? forever, as early as human history. Okay, this is such an advanced class. You are all very smart and correct. Um, yes, it goes back all of human history, of course. Um, queer people, and again, um, for anyone joining us, uh, I said at the beginning, queer is in, com in my context, for this workshop is anyone not cis and anyone not straight in any possible capacity. So um, we know, like how do we even know that queer people existed before even the written word? Um, there's a few ways. One, um, the image on the left is a Hindu deity who um, you can see is dressed kind of, or like physically um, presenting as kind of half male, half female. Um, and there are stone carvings, like statues of this deity and many other deities from a lot of um, different religions and spiritualities around the entire world. Um, who kind of embody male and female in one person. Um, going back in just imagery, even before the written word. So you can find those um, statues in these cave temples in India from, you know, uh, the BC era. And um, there are origin stories about the kind of beginning of the world according to a lot of di different indigenous peoples that involve um, deities that were male and female in one. So we know that concept goes back forever. Um, the other photo is um, from a, over a hundred years ago, taken in Chile and is 
one example of um, the dozens of two-spirit identities. These are the mache. Um, and two-spirit is um, an umbrella term, like the way I'm using queer, that refers to um, indigenous folks who we might call trans today. Um, because um, in their communities, they might have either had more than two genders or um, embodied, I mean, there are so many different ways across um, communities and, you know, from Canada to Argentina, the all of the Americas, um, all, I mean, it, there's just like hundreds and hundreds of different ways that genders were constructed over time. Um, and what we see around the world is that this idea that there's only male and female, those are the two genders, those are the two sexes, um, that came with the European um, colonists. And they're the ones who kind of said, we're not going to accept this anymore when when they erased um all of these cultures they took the queerness out with it and um there was a really rich um diversity of sexualities and genders uh before the arrival of these uh european men and um so sometimes people think of queer history as kind of a progression of, you know, it started with homophobia and now we're working for queer rights. But there's this whole era before the homophobia and transphobia and biphobia, et cetera, that was where queer people were not only accepted, but revered and honored um, in many places around the world um, um, before uh colonialism so that's my one other history lesson before all the cool stories i guess i lied okay another question what do the high five and the computer have in common you can type your answers in the chat i will tell you the best answer not that there's a best answer. One of my favorite answers that I ever got was um, somebody said digital connection. Think about it. Digital, like digits. Digits connecting and then digital connection for the computer. That is not what I'm looking for. If anyone has another guess or can beat that for a new favorite, I welcome it. No guesses? Well, okay. The high five and the computer were both invented by gays. Um, the computer is credited um, to Alan Turing, who lived in England during World War II and he created the computer because they were trying to beat the Nazis and they, in order to do that, they needed to break their secret code that they were using to communicate. And, um, Alan's, um, machine that he created automatically computed all the possible ways to break this code until it did break it and helped, um, the allies win uh, World War II and defeat the Nazis. So, um, pretty important invention, uh, for that time. And then of course went on to continue to develop, um, after his time and change the world in a lot of ways. Um, Alan was gay and he, um, it was illegal to be gay in England at, during his lifetime, just like it was illegal here in the US. And uh, he was arrested um, for um, 
for being gay. And um, he was given a choice between two years in prison or um, being forced to take hormones, estrogen. Um, they thought that would make him not gay anymore if they could um, dull his libido. So um, he chose the hormones um, so that he could keep working. But since he had a criminal conviction, um, he was not allowed to keep working anymore. So um, his story is one of those really sad ones that we did a content warning for at the beginning. Um, but one part of his story that he never got to see that I really love is that um, there's a woman, Lynn Conway, who carried on his work um, in the 60s, helping IBM to create the, the microprocessors that are in all phones and computers today, the, a really huge breakthrough. She um, was fired by IBM for transitioning from male to female um, in the 60s. And they legally fired her for, for doing that. Um, and the reason I bring her up is not just because she was carrying on Alan's work, but because she has a successful career in tech today. So that's the difference that a generation can make is um, her story has a happy ending. And um, that's the kind of difference we can all make by working towards um, having Lynn's story have a happy ending, even though Alan's didn't in his time. So, the inventor of the high five, who even knew the high five had an inventor? Um, someone had to do it first, and that person was Glenn Burke, and he was a baseball player in the 70s. He played for the major leagues for a little while, and he was one of the two people who did the first high five um, when a teammate came around home plate um, to score a run. and they, it kind of took off and it was a baseball thing and the Dodgers tried to trademark it and they were selling high five t-shirts. Uh, and then it just kind of became, you know, quickly spread to all sports and then just everybody. Um, and so we have Glenn to thank for that. Uh, Glenn came out on the Today Show in 1982. That's before Ellen. Um, and he didn't last long in the majors, but he did play for a gay softball league for um, a long time um, and made a huge step for gay athletes um, by coming out so early and publicly. So a few more stories. Uh, Christina of Sweden lived in the 1600s in Sweden and I'm going to use they, them pronouns for Christina. Totally unknown what pronouns they might have chosen today. Uh, but they were supposed to become, or they did become, queen of Sweden. And um, But being queen meant you had to get married. And because Christina was assigned female at birth, that meant they had to marry a man. And Christina did not want to get married, refused, um, was appalled by the idea. And so when they were in their 20s, they were like, I'm not going to be queen anymore. Um, completely gave it up, um, said someone else can go be queen and marry a king, um, took off on horseback, um, dressed in male clothing, never came back, first negotiated a deal where they would get um, money, land, power, et cetera, forever, um, servants, um, even though they weren't queen anymore, and settled in Rome and 
um, lived out a long, happy life, dating men and women, dressing as male and female, um, totally living their best life, and couldn't care less that they could have ruled an entire country. They just lived as an individual. Um, so many different identities can see pieces of themselves reflected in Christina, which is really cool. So Christina has been kind of claimed as lesbian for being someone who was assigned female at birth who refused to marry a man. Um, there's evidence of them loving um, men and women. So there's bi identity. There's also plenty of evidence that they might have been asexual or identified that way if um, they were alive in our culture and time. Um, I, from what I've seen, I think maybe biromantic, asexual, um, non-binary, but like truly, I think it's awesome if you can see yourself um, reflected in somebody who lived in the 1600s. Um, go for it, as long as you're not excluding anybody else seeing themselves reflected in that person. Um, and so, yeah, I am such a fan of Christina. Now, here is a really important doctor. First, dig this look. Look at the pipe and the glasses. Like, is this a tweed coat? I'm living for it. Um, this doctor drastically reduced, um, like, when he came of age, tuberculosis was the leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, by the time his life was over, because of his work pioneering x-rays, um, being able to look in people's lungs and detect it earlier and start treatment earlier, um, TB deaths had gone way down. Like, forget about flattening the curve, just like taking the curve away. Um, Alan was also a pioneer as the first documented trans man in the U.S. to um, ever have a surgery done that was part of a physical transition. Um, and so that was 100 years ago. Um, and, you know, nobody needs or, you know, not that surgery is the only way to transition, but for Alan, who wanted that, um, you know, it was probably really scary to kind of do an experimental surgery, um, the, be the first person to ever try to do that. Um, and he did it. He found a way to get it done, made it um, more possible for people who wanted it after him. And um, so just like a really interesting guy who both, who like transitioned two totally different sides or pioneered two different sides of medicine, like in his personal and professional life at the same time. And here is that chart. Um, that's TB deaths in the U.S. from 1860 to 2020. And you can see the time he was alive in there um, being the time it goes down. So there were other factors um, further down. There's like a vaccine is developed, things like that. Um, but Alan Hart deserves a lot of credit. Um, now, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz from Mexico City, um, was a woman who didn't have many options. She grew up in a time when women, just like Christina, and she actually wrote about Christina and was like, Edu you know, she referred to Christina as a woman, um, which is how Christina was viewed by many during their time. 
when I was like educated women like Christina are super important. Um, but this wasn't really Juana, Christina had what came from as much privilege as you can have with being royalty and rich. Juana was poor and a commoner and not royalty. So Juana didn't have the option to just give up everything um, and do whatever she wanted. If she wanted to find a way to not have to get married, which is what women had to do in her time, um, because women couldn't work to provide for themselves, they needed a husband to work and provide money for them to live, not that they could own the money, but um, you know, be able to have a home and food. So Juana found a choice for herself that she was gonna become a nun. Uh, that was one of the only ways that you could not get married and not live on the streets. Um, so Juana became a nun in a monastery and she used her time in between five prayers a day, seven days a week to, um, study, write, read, um, tinker with like the sciences and the arts and, uh, she advocated for women's education in 1600s Mexico, which is extremely badass, got in a lot of trouble, but still managed to um, kind of keep her job as a nun. Um, and I thought of including her as one of today's stories because she was never really left the monastery walls and lived in social isolation with just the other nuns. Um, she's in a presentation about queer history because, um, oh, thank you for the answer, Tristan. Uh, Juana wrote love poems to the vice queen um, of Mexico uh, who, that's the wife of the Viceroy. It, it was, there wasn't a king and queen, there was a Viceroy and a Vice Queen. It's just kind of how the political structure of Mexico worked. But um, she couldn't really physically be with Maria Luisa, um, but her poems to Maria Luisa live on today and she is considered one of the best poets of the Spanish language. Um, and yeah, lady version of a monk, if that word makes sense. Um, so yeah, um, Juana, very cool. And there's a Mexican lesbian rights organization named after her today. Um, I believe this is our last of the six. Um, Bayer Rustin was kind of the right-hand man to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in the U.S. civil rights movement. And we know this movement today as um, nonviolent. So Bayer Rustin was kind of the person who convinced Martin Luther King and other leaders to use nonviolence as the tactic to um, promote their agenda of racial equality. So organizations like the NAACP, so like leaders of the civil rights movement thought nonviolence might be weak, but Bayard Rustin um, studied under Gandhi in India, brought these ideas back, started in the 1940s to um, nonviolently work to integrate buses long before Rosa Parks. I realize you may not have gotten to this part of history in school, um, so I'm sorry if this is, um, I don't know if I have time to like go into the whole background, but basically this guy um, believed in nonviolence, which means kind of like, not fighting back, not starting a fight, 
as his whole tactic and one huge example of nonviolence that nonviolent action that he put together was the 1963 March on Washington. And if you've ever heard um, the I Have a Dream speech, that's the march where that was given. Um, and Byard's, if you look at a video, like he's right there next to Martin Luther King. Um, he's always kind of right there, kind of guiding, but he couldn't be the front spokesperson of the movement because he was gay. Um, and he had been arrested for that in 1953 in California. And so he had this record and this um, stigma. Uh, and so people discriminated against him for being gay and um, both within and outside of his movement. And so he could never kind of be the big name that Martin Luther King became, um, but he still made huge contributions um, to the movement. And he was given, um, his partner, Walter, was given uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama um, posthumously, which means um, after he had passed away. Um, he, um, he died like 30 years ago. So, um, oh my gosh, is that how long 1987? I was born in 86. I'm 33. So, um, he, he worked for queer rights, um, after, um, racial equality, um, and is another great person to kind of Google on your own too. Okay, so those are our six stories. Um, we made it through lots of me talking to get to the q and um, I'm curious if any of these people you might identify with, just think about for a minute, like, Maybe you want to be a doctor. Maybe you want to go into tech. Maybe you want to ride off from all responsibility and live by yourself in a Mediterranean country. Um, like, would you like to live alone like Juana? Um, do you want to be an athlete? Like, or maybe some of these people are you're drawn to because um, of their identities. Um, these are a lot of different, like, personalities, and I'm wondering if you kind of can relate to any of them. The Swedish, uh, so I'm going to type the name of the MLK right-hand man, um, Bayard Rustin. And the Swedish one's name is Christina of Sweden. And I'm writing their Swedish name, uh, Christina. All right, so a couple of people are also digging Christina like I do. Um, that's just kind of about like being yourself no matter the cost. And um, it wasn't easy. Uh, there was political trouble. There was a lot of stuff that went along with making that choice. But um, Christina was going to be themselves no matter what. And yeah, oh, everybody, yeah, so amazing. Um, so you can, Greta Garbo, also queer, played Christina in a movie in the 1930s called Queen Christina. There are like these black and white clips that are pretty kid friendly from that movie uh, on YouTube of, um, Greta Garbo dressed in as kind of a masculine queen uh, and talking about how 
she doesn't want to get married. Um, so that's something you could totally look into. There are not any like kids books or teen books about Christina, but there are um, grown up biographies and there is um, a grown up um, movie too that just came out a few years ago, uh, indie, and I think in Swedish. Um, so a couple, uh, yeah, so Bard Rustin is also super amazing. Um, there is so much to learn from his leadership and um, his life. Uh, there is a documentary that I think is, last I knew it was on Netflix, I know stuff kind of can come and go from there, but it's called Brother Outsider, um, if you want to learn more. Um, he's kind of, to be honest, like, picture books are kind of going to be my next thing, and like, Christina and Bayard are probably like, very, very top of the list. Uh, Oh my gosh. So people are talking about a podcast about Christina. I listened to one that was like, oh, what you missed in history. Oh, history is gay. I love history is gay. That is a great podcast. I have been a guest on it and I'm like trying to schedule my next appearance on it. Um, and, but if you search Christina of Sweden in wherever you get your podcasts. For me, it's like the podcast apps in the Apple App Store. Um, you can find different history-related podcasts that have done a Christina episode um, before. And then you can just kind of look at the age rating of that podcast. Um, okay, so oh, I keep pressing. If people want to unmute at this point, I think it's enough of a free-for-all that we don't have to keep, um, or I think we can all, uh, you don't have to if you don't want to like identify your voice or anything, but um, you may type or speak any just reactions, comments, questions. The questions could be more about these people, more about queer history, or what it's like to write a book, or that kind of stuff just for me. So, go for it. Hi. People. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, like okay uh what gave you like the inspiration like what made you want to write the book great question um so i <laughs> i didn't even know i was going to write this book because the publisher came to me and we're looking for someone to write a queer history book for teens do you want of course i do um so that question is what gave me the inspiration, I guess. But uh, the thing that got me started into sharing queer history before the book in the app, um, which is kind of what led to the publisher approaching me, um, was that it meant so much for me as a teen to know that there had been other queer people when I was figuring out that I was queer, um, it meant everything to me to know that I wasn't alone. I wasn't the first person to feel this way. And people that I had something really special in common with, people from my community who I consider, like came to consider my ancestors and my family, um, they had done incredible things and that meant that I could do incredible things too. We don't always get to see the representation in the media um, that, you know, we can be more than either tragic stories or punchlines or so 
knowing that like you know I identify as lesbian so when I found other lesbians in history and found out that they had been uh, poets and activists and all of these awesome things it it was just something that I wanted to bring to other teens so that they could know um that they weren't alone and they weren't the first and they're not weird and they're not part of a fad they're part of all of human history and um so that was definitely my inspiration in wanting to get um, queer history out there in a teen friendly way because who wants to read a textbook for fun? I did, but I knew not everybody would want to. Um, so that's why the voice of the, the teen book, um, Queer There and Everywhere is meant to be, it, it's not a for school book, it's for fun. Um, they're really short and they talk about like, you know, Abraham Lincoln is in there. When do we learn about Abraham Lincoln's dating life or depression or just like real stuff? Um, Cause all these people were totally real, even though, and they were just like us cause they were humans. Um, so, you know, you're like, oh, I could never be Abraham Lincoln and like lead the U S through a war. And like, uh, it's like, he was just a regular guy who, um, like all of these people were, even though they went on to like invent the computer and stuff like that. So um, even people who do things like invent the computer, like have crushes and drama and they go through teen years. Um, so, and that's what their stories focus on is like, what was it like for them as teens? What was it like for them figuring out they were queer? That kind of stuff um, that you don't always see in history books. Um, okay, there's a question on chat. I wrote an essay earlier this year um, for school about queer history. I was wondering how difficult and long it took to write your book. Um, Congrats, awesome, on writing a queer history essay for school. Um, I would love to hear more about it. If you've had like a specific topic that you used for that essay, that's really awesome. Um, it was, writing this book was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. Um, I was pregnant while writing it. And I was very, very sick with my pregnancy in and out of the hospital and um, bedridden. And just, it was a really tough time. And the publisher gave me like seven months to research and write the whole thing, which is nothing. <laughs> and there's like a year of editing and fact checking and everything that comes after it. But it takes about two years for a book to get made. Um, it has to be sent to the printers months before it comes out. So, um, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it was so hard. I, I cried about it a lot. Um, a lot of the stories I wanted to tell, I couldn't find enough research about. Um, to be able to tell their stories with like quotes and anecdotes and, you know, all these little details about dating and crushes and the stuff that I wanted to be able to tell to make these really relatable. And it meant that some people who had really important stories got left out. And that was something I really struggled with a lot. Um, and it's also why I wrote the second book because those biographies are one page and don't need a lot of detail. So I was able to tell those stories. I just needed to find a new format. And so I kind of had to accept this is what I can do for this format and be proud of what I was able to do in seven months while being sick. Um, you know, I turned it in after eight months. I wrote most of it in the last two months because everything I kept turning in, they said it wasn't teen enough. They said my voice was, my writing was too academic and 
because I was reading all these academic books for the research. And so, you know, if any of you are into writing, like reading is one of the most important things you can do while you're writing. So they told me, read some really good YA and then write. And that helped a lot. Um, and they were like, they wanted me to read like these bestsellers, like The Fault in Our Stars or something. And I found some really, like they weren't bestsellers, but I was, once you find what you want to write like, read that. And if you fill your mind with it enough, eventually it'll come out a little bit. So, um, uh, yeah, it was hard. It took less than a year. And I'm happy to email more if you want to write more than um, an essay. Six pages. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's time to wrap up. I really want to say thank you for volunteering your time. What a delight this has been for me and for Haley. Um, and I, re I really recommend that folks check out Queer There and Everywhere and Rainbow Revolutionaries. Um, I have pre-ordered the second one and I already have the first one. Um, and, you know, truly at Family of Quality, it's been um, a labor of love putting these, creating these online events for our families. Um, and one of the ways that we can sort of pay back our facilitators is by supporting them by buying their books and also by following them on social media. So if you have an opportunity, please take a moment to do that. And don't forget to go back to the Family of Quality Facebook page leave a comment saying a little bit about how you found this event. It helps us create, recruit, recruit more facilitators and get more people excited about what we're offering. Um, and when you follow Family of Quality on Facebook, you'll get a notification when we have more events coming up because we have some really amazing things coming up in addition to what happened today. So thank you so much, Sarah from Family of Quality. And thank you to everyone who stuck with us for this, uh, for this session. We really appreciate, uh, appreciate everyone. And Delia, say hi to Brianna for me. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Family Equality. Everyone support Family Equality. Follow them too.